Long, please turn with us to the book of 2 Timothy in chapter 2. Begin reading there with verse number 1. Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. Endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life, for then they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. And athletes cannot win the prize unless they follow the rules. And hardworking farmers should be the first to enjoy the fruit of their labor. Think about what I am saying. The Lord will help you understand all these things. Always remember that Jesus Christ, the descendant of King David, was raised from the dead. This is the good news I preach. And because I preach this good news, I am suffering and have been chained like a criminal. But the word of God cannot be chained. So I'm willing to endure anything if it will bring salvation and eternal glory in Christ Jesus to those God has chosen. May God add a blessing to the reading of his holy and perfect word. I'm going to start today by quoting one of my favorite all-time uh, classic films. Some of you might know it. Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, starring Jimmy Stewart. Um, he stars as a congressman, and he gives the following speech about halfway through the film. You see, boys sometimes forget what their country means just by reading the land of the free in history books. Then they get to be men and they forget even more. Liberty is too precious a thing to be buried in books, Mrs. Saunders. Men should hold it up in front of them every single day of their lives and say, I'm free to think and to speak. My ancestors couldn't. I can and my children will. This Saturday, of course, is uh, Veterans Day. Uh, November 11th, it was originally called Armistice Day, uh, to remember the treaty that ended the First World War, the war to end all wars, as it was called at the time. It was signed, of course, at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. <laughs> Then in 1954, Veterans Day was expanded in the United States to include all military, those who had served both in times of war and of peace. We owe our veterans certainly a great deal for their service. We also remember their families, the ones who kept things going while they were away, the ones who gave them incentive to serve. And so we thank all the veterans, as we already have honored them today, for your sacrifice. We remember and pray for all those who continue to serve around the world. For this moment, there are literally thousands of people in uniform who protect us. And it is a good thing never to forget that someone, somewhere, at this very moment is paying the price for the freedom that we are exercising. And the price that they pay is never cheap. It is good and fitting and right to pray for them for protection, guidance, and wisdom from the Lord. Some of you have seen combat. Some of you have lived through war. I have not. I thank God for that, but I know that some of you have seen what that conflict is. Some of you may have lost a relative, a friend, a family member due to war. And we all know that war is not a thing of the past. It continues around the world right now. The world is full of violence and war. People are living in the effects of that right now. Turn on the news and you will clearly see it. There are today children who will cry because they no longer have a place to live. They no longer have a parent to come home to. Unfortunately, there are going to be mothers and fathers today who may hold a lifeless body of their child in their arms, crying for the grace to continue to go on. The world is a difficult place at times. But God is not surprised by that fact. In fact, he speaks many times of the battle that is existence. That he calls us to be ready because in many ways, he knew that the world would always be at war. 
That's why he refers to us, as he does in this passage today, as soldiers. Soldiers for Christ, not with, of course, guns and bombs, but with the sword of the Spirit, with the Word of God. Because the world has now been in, and has always been in, a spiritual war. Perhaps the most important and eternal war of them all. There have been great wars that have been fought in our nation. The Revolutionary War, which, of course, gave birth to this great nation. The United States Civil War, which, of course, ended slavery. World War II, which helped uh, end uh, the slaughter of the Jewish people and certainly the end of authoritarian dictatorships in the world at that time. And there are certainly noble values to stand against such evil, but all nations and all groups will one day end because this world will end. But the things done in the spiritual battle, they have eternal consequence. They are the people that one day we will always be with God or we will not be with God based on our acceptance of Christ. So no mistake, we are in a serious battle and that God is giving us the fight to stand against the ways of this world that to many people follow. It seems like wisdom to them, but in the end is nothing but fool's gold. And so as Christians, we battle every day. Some of those things are external. They are outside ourselves. And certainly we don't have to be reminded of the battles, but some of them are also internal, our own thoughts and motives. So we need to listen to God, allow him to guide us because the world is going to lie to us. It's going to tell us things that aren't true. It's going to tell us things that we fear. Um, and those fears are going to try to stop us from continuing to do. They're going to say, you've done too many bad things. God can't use you. You're not smart enough. You don't know enough. You're too young. You're too old. You're not qualified enough. You're not good enough. You're too ugly and dumb and stupid and fat and blah, 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 blah. Lies. They're lies. So you have a choice to listen to lies or to rise above the father of lies and listen to your father who loves you and made you and has called you to serve in his army because he created you to do so. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to serve a perfect God. In God's kingdom, though, no one is forced to serve. It is up to you. Jesus will come as he did to his disciples and say, follow me. The requirement is up to you and your desire to serve. At this moment, he asks that we only have hearts, a desire to serve him, that we make him the top priority. If we allow him, he will lead and he will tell us what to do and we may do it. But effective soldiers must be loyal and obedient as Jesus' own disciples were. 12 came and 11 of them would go to suffer unto death in their service to him. That's why Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Ambassadors are those who go and represent someone else. They speak on someone else's behalf. They represent them in totality. And so when our lives, we represent Jesus. We speak for him. Our actions represent him. They bear momentum. So we need to ask daily, what do you want me to do? How will you guide me? And he focuses on those spiritual things, as Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, you are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. You're not defined by your past. You're not defined by what you have done. You're only defined in your willingness in this moment to repent, ask God for forgiveness, and to move forward seeking and following him because he changes us from the inside out. He changes our lives. He changes them the way in which we conduct ourselves, the words that we use, replacing our selfish will to his selfless one. That's why James tells us to be in control of our tongues because God changes our language. Instead of cursing people, now we want to bless them. We're more careful at times, hopefully, of the things we put in our bodies because we understand that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. It makes us more loving and forgiving. We know that in combat, if a soldier isn't prepared, they put themselves at risk and they put the lives of other people at risk. The same is true for us as soldiers for Christ. We must be prepared, prepared for the battle. And so we are to study, right? What are we to study? We are to study, great comment there. We are to study the Holy Word of God, right? And we are to study prayer and to seek God and wisdom. 
to share Jesus and to live for Him. But to be honest, right, many times we focus on spending more time not being prepared, right? No one would go fishing without making sure you had all your equipment first, right? You don't go out golfing without bringing clubs. You don't go camping without a tent. But for some reason, we just go out living in the world and not prepared for the things that God might ask us to do. So that when our coworker asks us, hey, why do you go to church? Or our family members in a crisis and they're like, I don't know where to turn to. I don't have any faith. We have no idea what to say because we haven't taken the time to prepare ourselves. And the truth is, it seems to me that sometimes we spend more time doing things like packing clothes for a trip than we do actually saying, what if someone asks me how to accept Jesus? Because we don't know what answer to give. And so maybe let's spend some time getting prepared. So when those chances and opportunities come, we're ready for them. So that we get the Bible from just being a book out here, but to something that's in here and in here that we know it. We know what it says. We don't have to memorize every single thing word for word, but we understand the heart of Scripture and we can understand key phrases that we remember and we can remember where to find things that we read. And we can use that to affect our lives and to share it with the lives who are around us. We all are going to have different jobs, different responsibilities, because God gives that to us. But I think of the words of John Newton, who wrote the very beautiful hymn, Amazing Grace, one of my favorites. He once remarked the following, which I think is absolutely true. If two angels were in heaven and they were given assignments by God at the same time, one, to go rule over the greatest nation on earth, and the other, to sweep the street of the dirtiest house, each angel would be completely indifferent to which they were assigned. It wouldn't matter to them. Why? Because the joy lies in being obedient to God. To be a follower of Christ, the important thing isn't what God has us to do. The important thing is that we do what God wants us to do. The important thing is to just do what God wants us to do. The joy comes in being obedient to whatever God asks us to do. Whatever we're doing, we can do it with the joy of God. If God called us to do it, He will be with us. What is He calling us to do? What is He calling you to do? Seek Him and ask Him if you're not sure. Because I guarantee He wants you to do something. And if you're not sure, keep asking until which time it is revealed in your heart and confirmed in your mind that you may feel God's joy in doing it. Look at our passage again. Paul is writing to his dear friend and younger protege, Timothy, writing from prison while in change to encourage Timothy to remain strong. He actually invites him by his words to join with him in his suffering like a good soldier should. Understanding the dangers, the trials, the perils that await Timothy as they awaited Paul. Because Paul is advising him that no one who serves as a soldier understands that there will be danger. There will be difficult. But as he tells them, don't get involved in civil affairs, but instead remember to please your commanding officer. Which of course is who? God. Because there can only be one which we are most loyal to, right? Because at some point, loyalties will be in conflict with one another. Priorities will be different between one something that calls us to serve and something else, right? But if we are a soldier in Christ's army, he must be the top priority. Everything else must be secondary. We can't serve two masters. We cannot be in two armies. We must choose. And so, to serve God is to pick Him, to serve Him first, not our, not our reputation, not power, not money, not even nation or family, but God must be first. You see, when we get tangled up with civil affairs, the messiness of this world, 
Sometimes we lose focus, right? We can get ensnared in political or national powers. And that is certainly not to say that as Christians, we don't have an obligation to live as citizens in this world and to be responsible and to vote and oppose wrongs of society and to do good things, of course. But even as we're serving in this world, our first allegiance is to Christ. For his kingdom is that which will live and reign forever. All the kingdoms of this world will one day dissipate. We need to learn what pleases God. How are we prepared to fight Satan, his lies, striving to become better and stronger, not just being bystanders, watching other people serve like they're marching on a parade and clapping, but instead to serve ourselves. I recall the words of Napoleon who once said, Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I, we have founded empires, but upon what did we rest our creation of genius? upon force. But Jesus Christ found his empire upon love. And this very hour, millions would die for him. You see, Jesus loved us so much that he would die for us. He took our sins upon himself. And all we have to do is trust him, follow him, and obey him to maintain our cohesiveness and effectiveness. But if we don't focus on Jesus, we're going to get off track. We cannot do the work that he is calling us to do. That's why Paul reminds us in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. The grim reality is that we are going to face in this world continual hardships because we are in continual battle with the forces of evil the lies and dominion of this world. And while we draw breath, that will be a difficulty we face. And yet at the same time, we can take refuge in this. Our commanding officer is Jesus Christ, who knows all things, who sees all things, and is perfectly right and good, and has the utmost love and concern for you. You see, sometimes I think we look out into a world that is dark and it looks to us hopeless at times. Things seem bad and they're only getting worse and we don't know what to do. God knows. He has already seen it. To him, the future is completely as crystal clear as the past. The victory is already won. We only need to do what he asks so that our hopelessness is not just a means of theological debate. It is a fundamental wrong view of reality. God wins. And when you serve him and you do what he asks you to do by proxy, you win. I recall being a very small child, I don't know if I was five or so, and going to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, my grandparents taking me there, and for the first time standing on those hollowed ground, I remember sitting uh, in reverent silence, thinking about the men who died in the very place in which I stood to give freedom to others. And I felt that same thing at other places, like the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, in places from Arlington to Antietam, I know that others have given their lives for the freedom that I have. And to those who have done so, I say thank you. I appreciate your service for freedom because I know that freedom is not free. But I also know that the freedom that any of us have in an earthly sense can be taken at any moment from us. It is a reality that some great dictatorship could come in at any moment and remove such freedoms. But what can never be taken from me is my freedom to accept Christ. No external force can ever take that from me, no matter what they do to me. It cannot be undone. That I get to know Christ and the power of his resurrection that gives me freedom, not only in this world, but in the one that is to come. That we may know Christ and the power of his resurrection so that as our old hymn says, we can go onward as Christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. 
God has called you, all of you, to serve him. He loves you and he knows you and he will be with you. Let us pray. Father, this week we have paused to honor veterans of the U.S. military, brave men and women who looked their own mortality in the face and continued on to do their duty. We thank you for their service. It is right and fitting to do so. But help us to also realize that in many ways, as followers of Jesus Christ, you have called us into a spiritual war. Help us to be prepared. Help us to trust you, to love you, to serve you and obey you. Help us to realize how serious it is that every day there are people who come into this world and others who leave it. That every life that has ever existed has with it an eternal soul, which you created, which you always intended to be with you, but to whom you have granted free will to serve or to reject you. As your soldiers, help us to stand with you Help us to be obedient to you, to follow your commands against the evil of this world and to seek to lead others in your truth. May our top priority be to love, serve, and obey you, Father. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.